Hello, good morning, everyone. Welcome to the 11th NOAA HABS forecast. Um, so we're happy to have many folks sitting here um, in the ODNR's Aquatic Visitors Center, the uh, historic fish hatchery for the state. Um, but we also have um, multiple hundreds that are joining us online via webinar. The webinar is being recorded. And so we will uh, provide that after the event is over. Um, what I'm going to do is, my name is Chris Winslow. I'm director for Ohio Sea Grant and also Ohio State University Stone Lab. I'll be your MC for today. And we're going to start off by having some uh, words, some welcoming words from some of our elected officials. And so we'll start off in that and then we'll roll into our nutrient loading, loading which will come from Dr. Laura Johnson from um, Heidelberg University. And so first off, we're going to come over to uh, Representative Dingle's office that's going to say some um, opening remarks for us. I just want to tell you how grateful I am to be here again today on something that is an annual event that is really important to me as you announce the harmful algae bloom forecast for Lake Erie. I want to thank all of my Great Lakes colleagues who are participating today for their very strong continued leadership. With the climate crisis, we will continue to see water levels rising and warming temperatures meaningful harmful algae blooms are gonna increase and these risks will endure into the future. We can't afford to let these algae blooms go unchecked. I applaud all the good progress that NOAA has been making over these past few years to identify, monitor, mitigate, and forecast the harmful for algae blooms. These forecasts are really important because they help drinking water managers and the tourism industry plan for the season, and they help NOAA anticipate climate change impacts. As co-chair of the Great Lakes Task Force, protecting water quality and our economy in the Great Lakes, uh, it rises far above partisanship in Congress. We all work together to protect our Great Lakes. Clean, safe water is essential to the Great Lakes' vital role in supporting tourism, commercial and recreational fishing, agriculture and manufacturing. And that's why these forecasts are so important. To make the necessary progress that we need towards understanding and addressing the threats that the harmful algae blooms pose to human health and our national economy, we have to support and prioritize a strong and coordinated federal response, which includes the good work of NOAA and its partners that are all here today and what you're engaged on. So I'm just very grateful for all the work that all of you do. I guess I can't start this because I have so many friends on this and say how stunned I am. I guess I shouldn't be stunned, but how worried I am about what the Supreme Court did today. I believe that clean air and clean water are basic human rights and we all have to keep working together to make sure we do not go backwards. Global climate's real. We've seen what these algae blooms are doing. So we gotta keep our sleeves rolled up and work together. Thank you for letting me be with you this morning. Thank you, Representative Dingle, and for making time out of your busy schedule to be with us this morning. Thank you very, very much. Next, we'll turn over. We have some um, recorded remarks from Congresswoman Kaptur. So we're gonna put those up next. And I'm happy to report that uh, David uh, Zavik, uh, an aide from Kaptur's uh, office is here with us in person. So if anybody wants to talk, that office, um, we can make that happen. Greetings. As chair of the U.S. House Energy and Water Appropriations Committee and co-chair of the bipartisan House Great Lakes Task Force, I would like to commend the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration for your diligent work to combat the scourge of Lake Erie, its harmful algal blooms. Lake Erie is a global treasure and an unparalleled regional asset. As the largest body of accessible surface freshwater anywhere on Earth, our Great Lakes serve as a source of life, of nourishment, and of economic vitality. Along the southern shore of Lake Erie live the hardworking people who make, build, and grow what makes, builds, and grows America. These are the people that I have the honor to represent in Congress. They are the people who enjoy a deep connection to our lake. Unfortunately, harmful algal blooms represent a grave threat to them and our way of life. Harmful algal blooms devastate abundant fish 
and natural wildlife and contaminate our water for the fishermen, families, and visitors from all around who visit our special corner of the world. Thankfully, we are marshalling an all-of-government approach to tackle this serious water crisis in partnership with the private sector. This approach, with strong leadership from NOAA, the Army Corps of Engineers, EPA, the Department of Agriculture, and more, is paving the way for a better future for Lake Erie. The mission of addressing and containing harmful algal blooms requires all of us. For all the generations to come, we must preserve and protect Lake Erie's majestic wonder. I look forward to working with NOAA and all our partners to continue this important work for the benefit of all and for the future. Thank you. I want to thank Congresswoman Captor's office for those words. We have some recorded remarks also some from Congressman Lada's office. So we'll play those next. And it's our play, it, we're really happy to have David Wirt um, with Lada's office here in the audience. And I'm sorry I couldn't be with you today. It's so important that uh, you're all together today because establishing the HAB, the harmful algal bloom forecast is so important. You know, it's when you look at the consortium that's worked together through the years of NOAA, the Ohio State University, Sea Grant, the, all the different universities and colleges and the consortium that have done this is so important for not only Lake Erie, but for the entire region of the country. Back in 2014, when we had the large algal bloom that uh, hit the Western Basin, I know that I got off the airplane that Friday morning at about seven o'clock, and the uh, first people I called was the Ohio State University Sea Grant uh, to find out exactly what they knew and how things were happening and what we could do into the future. And as everyone worked together to make sure that the uh, water was restored, especially for 500,000 people in the region, and uh, working with uh, all of the, a lot of you in the consortium, uh, I came up with the uh, legislation for the Drinking Water Protection Act back in 2014. That law was signed uh, and we uh, got it in 2015. It's important because again, we wanna make sure that uh, you know, we do have safe drinking water, that uh, everyone is working together from the federal, state and local level. We want to get everybody involved in this because again, this is for our region. It makes this is what makes our area such a great place to live. And so, as the uh, HAB uh, forecast is uh, projected, you're all an important part of it. So I want to thank you very much for all you do. And uh, anytime uh, you all have questions, please always feel free to give me a call. But I always will always give you a call. So thanks very much and have a great day. I want to thank. Congressman Lada for, for the pre-recorded message. I'd like to call up Erica Krause now. Erica is here from Senator Brown's office and wants to say a few words on Senator Brown's behalf. Thank you. Uh, unfortunately, the Senator couldn't be here in person today, but he asked me to come and say a few words in his place. Uh, my name is Erica Krause. I cover Northwest Ohio for Senator Brown. Um, and much like my colleague, in, colleagues in Representative Kafter's office and Representative Latta's office, I'd be happy to talk with any of you um, about any issues or questions that you have. Um, so thank you all for joining us today. Um, and thank you to all of the partners and researchers here um, and joining us online um, who work every day um, to keep Lake Erie healthy um, and all of our waterways across Ohio healthy. Um, the senator has fought for over the years and helped win significant dollars um, for the GLRI um, and other programs to help uh, keep our, not only the Great Lakes healthy, um, but all of our waterways across Ohio. In our bipartisan infrastructure law that was passed last year, um, Senator Brown was able to secure significant funding to help communities and residents improve their water and wastewater systems. Um, that we know are going to help keep pollution out of our natural waterways across the state and make a huge difference. Um, and uh, earlier this year in the uh, FY22 uh, budget, we also were able to secure funding for a new Tri-River Research Alliance at Defiance College um, that is going to set up um, a new home for research in far western Ohio um, and to do more work um, in sort of where the water comes into the state of Ohio. So we have more information there. Um, and another example of innovation from right here in the state of Ohio. 
Um, the senator has said for many years um, that here in Ohio, we've proven um, that we don't have to choose between having a clean environment and having a strong economy. Um, and uh, we can and must do both. And we've been able to do that with Ohio workers and Ohio researchers leading the way. So thank you very much. Thank you, Erica, and thank you, Senator Brown. Um, just wanted to recognize two other individuals that are in the audience with us today. So we have Representative Dan Troy and, and, and Representative Mike Sheehy here also, and both raising hands. Either one of you want to say a few words? Uh, Dan, please. Thank you. Thank you, Chris. You know, I always enjoy coming out here uh, because, uh, you know, I've had a long relationship with the Ohio Sea Grant Program. I served in the legislature back in the 80s and 90s and, uh, you know, always worked with the folks from Sea Grant because I always thought this is the lead agency that's taken a good hard look at protecting our lake, uh, which obviously is Ohio's greatest asset. I want to thank the NOAA people, uh, you know, for obviously uh, being involved in these forecasts here. When I was in the legislature in the late 80s, uh, I was able to get Ohio to be the last of our Great Lakes states and uh, Ontario province to uh, join in uh, banning uh, the sale of any detergents that contain phosphorus. And that, you know, that made a little uh, impact in terms of the water quality of Lake Erie. But obviously, with climate change, we've had uh, considerable additional problems. We don't get gradual rains anymore. We get four or five inch rains that come, uh, as I used to tell my city engineer when I was on city council, how come we get these 500 year storms every three years? So uh, what, uh, what we know is that uh, it's a problem, uh, but we also know what, what, the, what the causes are. So unlike a lot of other uh, maladies, uh, we know what the solution is. We know that it requires a cooperative effort between our agricultural interests, between our environmental interests, between higher education, uh, using science and facts to deal with this. So we know how to manage this problem. We know how to maintain and improve the health of our Great Lake Erie. So let's be about that business. Thank you very much. Thank you, Representative Troy. Uh, thank you, uh, Mike Sheehy. I represent a district where the Maumee River flows into the western basin of Lake Erie, a very rich agricultural and industrial area. And I've always been very proud of the, uh, the water uh, systems that we have and, and the wastewater systems that we have in the area. We are challenged today with the issue that, uh, of algal blooms, and we have to reach an accommodation between the strongest interest in the uh, Ohio legislature, which is since 1803, the agriculture industry, something that we're all very, very proud of, and we want to continue in the future. But we, as, as my colleague uh, Dan has just said, we have to work together in an effort to come to a solution, to an accommodation where we can grow our crops, protect the soil, and protect the, the vital waters in the western basin of Lake Erie and all of the Great Lakes. And I'm grateful for the folks here, the scientific, scientific people since the Middle Ages, the scientific, science people have been the sort of people that have pointed the way to whether it's from the stars and the moon or the soil uh, today, People in the science have shown the way, but people in political life do not always have the political and the moral courage to do the right thing. I won't be here next year, but I'll be here uh, uh, and watching you probably in a video. And I thank you for the opportunity, Chris, and the work that you've done. Thank you, Representative Sheehy. So as we call Laura Johnson up to give her presentation, I just want to recognize that there are a ton of our elected officials online watching the webinar and agency folks, but also we have some agency folks in the room. Um, and so I just love the, the attendance that we have here. So um, without further delay, we're going to bring up Dr. Laura Johnson, who is the director of the National Center for Water Quality Research at Heidelberg University. And she's going to give you some information on, on the loading from this year. Ah. All right, we're good. Everyone can hear me. Good. Okay, so uh, hi, everyone. 
it's so nice to be back in person again. Too bad everyone on the webinar can't be here as well, but that's okay. We need to, to make sure we stay safe anyway. Um, I am here to talk about what we've been finding in the Maumee River since March. I've been dutifully looking at the data. So let's go, go forward here. So um, just a brief reminder, there's a lot of monitoring that's happening on the uh, US side of Lake Erie. This goes all the way over towards, uh, I think it just goes to the end of Ohio, but that's fine. Um, each one of the dots here are places where either ourselves or USGS are collecting water samples to understand what's coming into the lake from any of these main rivers. I put little H's, our little Heidelberg symbol for all the places where we're monitoring. Hopefully Ohio EPA won't mind that I altered their map a little bit <laughs> because I love those little H's. Um, and as a quick reminder on how we do this, we at each one of those locations where we're collecting samples, we pull samples using a refrigerated automatic sampler. Every week we go and retrieve those samples and return them to the lab for analysis. Major nutrients and sediments is what we're mostly focused on and chloride as Doug Kane will tell you all about. And um, we uh, analyze one sample at a minimum every day, but we'll do up to three samples a day during high flow. There are a couple of cool new things we're playing around with these days. One of them is, you can see the tiny little picture of it's a green eyes new lab, which basically is getting us real time phosphorus and nitrate data. We have that in three locations or testing them out to see um, how useful and informative that is. We're, we're focusing on really small watersheds where changes happen rapidly for that information. On top of that, we also have, you can see a little blue stick that's in our receiving base. And we have um, multi-parameter SONs, so lots of sensor packages. And with the help of GLOSS, we've been able to put those at all of our stations in Lake Erie that don't already have one because of USGS. And that that data is now online. You can find it at their Seagull platform um, anytime, like currently. It's been up for a couple months now. And then our final new this year thing is that we got our data onto an online data repository called Zenodo. And so if you need to cite our data, this goes to the researchers out there that are listening in. If you want to use our data and cite it, we have a good official citation to make your life just a little bit easier, make it easier for us to track as well. And so today, although we collect all of this data, I'm going to talk about phosphorus from one of those stations. <laughs> so we're really narrowing it down as to what we're monitoring here. And I just want to do a brief reminder on the different main forms of phosphorus that you usually hear thrown around. The first one is total phosphorus or TP, and that is the phosphorus that is contained in the mud and the sediments as well as the water when you collect that muddy water sample from a river. We filter out the particles onto a piece of filter paper, paper so particulate phosphorus, and anything that makes it through is dissolved reactive phosphorus. And that's the stuff that is very easy for algae to use. For the purposes of the forecast, we calculate a total bioavailable phosphorus. That's what we've learned is very useful for, uh, for our forecasting. And that's simply the amount of phosphorus that's available to algae, but then also that makes it from where we sample up in Waterville all the way out to the lake. So that ends up being all of the dissolved reactive phosphorus and then about 8% of the particulate. So what I'm going to focus on today is showing you the starting with the total bioavailable phosphorus. And although you guys can't see what's hidden behind there is also the dissolved phosphorus and the particulate phosphorus, those component parts of total phosphorus. Chris is going to fix it for me. <laughs> All right. So, very nice. okay, so let's go into what we found this year. So I just wanted to show you guys the raw data and kind of go through that process because I haven't done this in a few years and I thought you might want a little reminder about what it takes to get to that final load number. So this is just a figure that's showing flow in blue. You can see we had, you know, a handful of storm events and then the red dots are all, you know, those concentrations of the samples that we collected. So the first thing you note is that um, our flow this year was never really extremely high. It is maybe got up to around 20,000 MGD, so million gallons per day, which would really be 20 billion gallons per day. But for the mommy, that's a huge amount of water, but for the mommy, that's not that much. I actually lowered the scale a little bit. I was gonna do it relative to 2015, but 2015 would have gone up to 70,000. So you wouldn't have even seen any of the flow events. Um, for each one of these storm events, you can see concentrations increase to about the same amount. It goes up when it rains, it comes down when it doesn't rain. 
and it would go up to about, you can't quite see that scale on the side, but it's about 0.14 milligrams per liter. Then our next step is we take those daily concentrations and then we multiply them by the, the flow for that day and we get a daily load. So now we have dots for each one of the days. And what you notice when we do this is that when we have bigger storm events, we get bigger peaks than when we have smaller storm events. All right, and that really shows us that even if we had similar concentrations, we see changes in loads because of flow. Now this allows us to do some really fun calculations everyone seems to like, which is that we can assess how much of the load happened in what percent of time. So 70% and this particular spring, 70% of our total bioavailable phosphorus load occurred over 35 days or about 20% of the time. And these weren't even that big of storm events. And so this is why we always talk about how it's the load during these storm events, which is what we really need to be working on because that's when it all gets out to the lake. And then our last step is that we sum up each one of these days over this period of time to see how it accumulates from March to July. What you can see is that anytime there's a storm event, there's a bump up in, um, in the loading. Um, you can see that from July or from June to July, we obviously are not quite in that month yet. So we are um, projecting what those days, what that data is. So this is the official figure that you'll see in the, the forecast bulletin that goes out. Uh, basically where we are right now is at 230 metric tons. By the end of July, we expect to be somewhere between 232 and 251, which is straddling the, the target load of 240. You can see that we're a little bit lower than 2020 and 2021, but nowhere near as high. You know, definitely not nearly as high as what we were in 2015, which is the green line, but we're definitely higher than where we were in 2012, which is the blue line. I say there are minimums and maximums, but I know the years because that's what happens. Okay, so let's think about how this year's data compares to the past. At first, I wanted to show you loads, but to show you loads, we have to look at flow. So this is showing flow. Each bar is a different year, and then the line is the running five-year running average. And you can see it oscillates over time. But basically, we saw an increase in the 2000s, and we've kind of remained at that level. I suspect once we have a few more years, we're going to start to see that coming down based off of this year. And so currently, we're at 2.5 cubic kilometers of water has come out of the Maumee River since March. On average, between 2002 and 2018, we would normally be at about three and a half. So we're definitely lower than our average of the past, you know, 20 years or so. So when we look at total particulate phosphorus, we see a similar thing. We saw the, you see that particulate phosphorus had high loads early in our period of record, but then it's basically been oscillating just like flow. And so this year, our target, our loads are just a little bit above the target at 748 metric tons, lower than average, but higher than the target. And that's because of how flow has been. And then the, the dissolved reactive phosphorus, this is the one where we see that the loads are really high early in the period of record. They bumped down below the target when we got into the 80s and 90s when the lake was recovered. And then they've slowly increased and started to level off since, um, go right ahead. And, and they've started to level off since around the 2000s. So 2003 is about when the blooms came back. Oh, that's lovely. Thank you. Um, and so we are currently just a little bit below the target. We're at 172 metric tons. On average, these past 20 years or so has been around 300, so we're definitely lower than average. The target's 186. So, but it's all being driven by flow. So that that's always complicates our understanding of loads. So how do we deal with that? Um, and the way to do that is to look at concentration. We look at flow weighted means, which is essentially taking that load and dividing it by flow. Seems like a pretty easy way of thinking about these things. First, I wanna show you total particulate phosphorus, which basically trended down, hasn't changed drastically, just some oscillations since the 2000s, and we're above the target. And then dissolved reactive phosphorus, which is that U-shaped curve that I show pretty much every time I give a talk. Um, so we have concentrations are high. They went down to the target in the 90s and came back up and have remained up since then. But I want to zoom in in our 2002 to 2022, so this 20-year time frame that we have, so we can look for any trends that have happened recently. It's hard to see when you have so much data sometimes. And so you can see that for this year, 
total particulate phosphorus is almost exactly like it was on average. I also highlighted the 20, 2008, since that's our base year, almost exactly the same as 2008, um, and well above our target of 0.18 milligrams per liter. Dissolved reactive phosphorus is a little bit on the lower end, it's lower than our long-term average of 0.08, so we're at 0.067, so well above our target. And you can see it's within the realm of variation that we've seen since 2002. Um, we tend to see these concentrations go down a little bit when we have dry years. I have some thoughts. If ODA folks want to talk about why I think particulate phosphorus might be up and the same as average for this year. And then our final way of really assessing whether we're seeing trends in the data is to look at our flow versus, uh, our flow versus load plots, right? So in here you can see, I'm just going to come point at the screen real quick, that when, when the flow is really high, we have very high loads. When flow is low, we have low loads, right? And so you can see how these go. These small dots are all 2002 to 2018. This is a really good relationship here. These two lines are the prediction intervals. So if we're outside of these lines, we're outside of what we would expect at that flow for our typical past few years. So this year, flow is kind of low, like around the, up this end of the spectrum. You can see that the red dot is directly on the line, meaning that for total particulate phosphorus load is exactly where we would expect it to be given how much flow we have. So within these prediction intervals, no big change. For particulate phosphorus, maybe your eyes are drifting up here. Look, at this point, this was higher than, than um, what we would have expected or predicted. That was 2020, following that 2019 fallow year when planting couldn't happen. There's a lot of ground working to deal with those really difficult fields then, and we saw it in our data. For both DRP and total bioavailable phosphorus, same thing. You can see we're right here. You can see we're below the target but really right within those prediction intervals. So both DRP and total bioavailable phosphorus are where we would expect to be based off of where flow is. Um, there are, the, the outlier here is 2019, which we've talked a lot about, which is um, loads were 30% lower than expected. You can see it's lower than our prediction intervals because folks couldn't plant in 2019. So there was much lower fertilizer application. And I probably have gone long, so I'm gonna, have my very few conclusions here. They're very simple. We're in our third consecutive year of lower than average stream flow. So we've had between, you know, basically 2020, 2021, and 2022 have been dry compared to what we have seen recently. Not drier than our whole period of record, but for these past 20 years or so. Prior to 2020, flow hadn't been this low since 2016 and then 2012. So, you know, it's this kind of unusual given, at least for the period of time I've been working here. Um, but our phosphorus loads then are going to be near the target load because of this. Flow is low, loads are low. That's just how it works. But our concentrations are still above the targets. There doesn't seem to be strong downward trends that we can detect using our observed data so far. So with that, I really want to point out, I put pictures of our staff, both new and from the past, or we have had a turnover in the past couple of years. But the thing is, is that we generate all this data with relatively few people and they do an awesome job. And so it's worth, worthwhile to, to point them out and all the great work they do. And this is all of my information if you need to be in touch. Thank you for that, Laura. We're gonna go into Rick Stump with the actual forecast, but after the forecast, then we'll open it up for some questions for both Laura and Rick before we move our rest of the way through the, the forecast. So uh, Rick Stump working with uh, NOAA, specifically NCOS, the National Center for Coastal and Ocean Science. Rick. Is that? Thank you. Um, so this uh, forecast, it's a, a joint effort. Um, I'll say we can't do this without Laura's data. That's critical because we need the inputs. We also, in NOAA, the uh, Ohio uh, River Forecast Center is necessary for getting the um, going we do early season projections and going forward and getting the loads going into the end of July. So they're critical. And then we use an ensemble of models that come from Carnegie, um, Carnegie Institute, Stanford, and also University of Michigan. So a collection of, of efforts here. Okay, uh, just to recap for last year, um, 2021, our forecast, oh good, it's just off the board here. Um, it was, we forecast lower than we observed um, last year. I'll explain what was. It was um, 3.5 and we were up, um, I think, close to six. 
Um, what I will note, though, is on the whole, it was the bloom covered a large area at a relatively low intensity. So voters out would not have noticed much scum or such. It was spread out over a large area. And what I put in as a contrast is 2019, which is a far, far more intense bloom, far more severe bloom. And the scale is not, it's, it's not a linear scale. So if it's orange or red, it's really bad. So 2019, there could have been scum anywhere in those orange red areas, and there frequently was. And that, this has to do with the winds. So last year, we tended to have a slightly more westerly wind, and in 2019, a slightly more northerly wind. So that northerly wind piled it all up on the basin. We would like to be able to forecast wind direction. We're actually trying to work towards this to see if we can come up with some estimate of, of how much might be covered. So we're, we're testing that now. And if we can do it, because trying to forecast wind direction going out 30, 60 days is a challenging uh, proposition, but we are working on some models to try to approach that. But just to point out, it does vary a lot between years. Um, so just to touch on this, uh, what happened 2021 and 2020 had about the same total phosphorus load, bioavailable phosphorus, and they were quite different. Well, what I'd like to draw attention is some of these years and on the bottom graph we have on the red bars it's march to june bioavailable phosphorus and the right next to the blue bar is through july and you can see on these pairs there are several years where the blue is a little higher than the red um, and those are higher july loads and these i particularly note it's intense years some years like 2011 and 2015 there was so much flow in the spring it doesn't matter but if you look proportionately huge amount of the load came in in july and one of the factors we think is the July load. This is when the bloom starts growing. It starts, it just starts now and it slowly grows through July. And that's a prime time to get the phosphorus in. We don't, we have not had a lot of major July loads in the past. So it's difficult to model something that you don't observe um, and trying to put it together. There's also temperature effects as well. If the bloom starts late, which it has in some years, 2008 is an example. We didn't get in a huge impact for it. And it was because it was cold to start with. So the bloom started late, so it did not have an opportunity to tap the July load. So we think the factor that was driving the difference between 2020 and 2021 is the July matters a bit more. It uses more of the July load than it does the spring. So some of that spring gets lost in the system, which if you think about it, March, April, phosphorus settles out, maybe it moves out of the system. So we don't gain quite as much. So we're just, we are adjusting the models to take this into account. So we hope in the future we're better. And that's an important thing. We don't keep static with the models. They get updated and modified as we go through. Um, this just shows um, we have now with satellite 20 years of data and the different patterns in years, the, the really strong years you can see by the intense orange and red, um, 2015, 2013, 2011 uh, were comp particularly striking. Uh, those who were around in Cleveland in 2011 can appreciate when they had scum going all the way to Cleveland. That was very much due to very strong westerly winds. The changes between years, again, are wind direction. Uh, people in Ohio are hoping for south, southwest winds. People in Ontario are hoping for north winds. Um, that's the way it works. The best is kind of a due west, so it ends out somewhere in the middle. That would be best compromise for all of us. Um, we have a bulletin um, starting now. Um, this is now web updates. Um, we remind you weekly, those who have subscribed, you've been getting the early season projections, but we, up, we remind you weekly of this. The PDF does not go out automatically, but we update imagery every clear day. The models are updated every day. And so the forecast where the bloom is, we say where the bloom is and where we expect it to be for the next three days. So you have that information. We also have a um, estimation of whether there might be scum formation over the next three days as well for boaters. And also if it mixes into the water, which is relevant for water suppliers as well. So all that information is available at our site um, as well. Um, I think if, you, if it's too long for anyone to type, you can, if you Google NOAA, like Gary have forecast, you will be able to find it. Um, um, we have, again, satellite imagery. Um, today's a beautiful day for a satellite. Um, and there's just the slightest hint of cyanobacteria in over in the far western Amami Bay, just the beginning trace. Um, um, 
uh, Sandusky Bay tends to start early, and yes, there is a there is a bloom of a phanosomenon and some microcystis in Sandusky Bay now. That's typical. That's a completely different process driven by the Sandusky River. It has nothing to do with the Western Basin, and it pretty much most of the time stays in there unless there's a high flow event out of Sandusky that pushes it out. Right? We don't expect that pretty much this year. It should pretty much stay there. And this is our ham monitoring site. You can tap. So ensemble of models. I'm not going to go through the left slide of the slide. Um, I'm sure you will appreciate that, but the modelers types will know. There's a variety of modeling and modeling approaches of statistical, Bayesian, various sorts through this group. Key thing is from the from the um, the the right side. Um, you know, the load, as Laura said, right now we're 230. We expect up to 252 um, metric tons of TPB bioavailable phosphorus. That's what we're working with as an input. These models do include not just this march, they include multiple components of, of going into the models. So it's not just a simple regression. Um, I will say, as we've as said, July does matter. And we're obviously here on June 30th. And so many people will ask, well, what's gonna happen in June? Currently, it looks like we're gonna have an average June for rainfall. That's the, the upper part here. If it's green or orange, green is higher than normal, orange is lower. And so if it's white, it's average. That's about three, four inches of rain in this area. So we expect it to rain, but three, four inches of rain, I will note corn, um, evapotranspiration, everyone took high school ecology biology, um, it evaporates a lot of water, several inches of water. So if you get an inch of rain or two inches of rain, the ground's also dry. No one needs to panic. This is normal. It does rain in Ohio. Um, so we're expecting a typical July flow at this point. We will update the forecast at the end of July just, just to confirm this as well. Um, but we are looking at um, um, not much change, as you can see in the progressive plot on the end. Um, so the forecast, um, we're not expecting a large bloom um, because of our average to slightly below average discharge in loads. So we're looking at about a three and a half severity. Um, that's definitely smaller than last year. Um, um, the range could be two to four. That's uncertainty in the models. Um, I think you can appreciate we can't nail things down exactly. So we're looking at pretty close to what would probably be 2020 or 2018 as far as what we expect for the severity. I would like to say we could tell you exactly where it will be, but we're not there yet. But we will be able to update. You will know where the bloom is overall. Again, no major rainfall um, expected going into July, but there will be normal events. Something else, um, the question here is where are we? Um, now, Laura noted that we're a little above below average for the last 20 years, but if we go back um, to 1940, when discharge started, we're actually right at the long-term average. And there tends to be, appears a cycle of higher discharge, wetter, um, lower, wetter. Cycles in climate are not unusual. But the key one in the last 14 years is it's, we've only had two years below the long-term average. And the highs, the high flow years have all been higher than the ones in the past. Um, there's uh, evidence now coming out. We're getting heavier rainfall events, and this is very likely a climate impact. And when you have heavier rainfall, um, the soil cannot absorb it as well, and so more of it runs off. So if you have four inches of rain at once, you get far more runoff and discharge than if you have a slower. Any gardener can appreciate. You want a light. You want an inch of rain over a whole day. Light soaking rain, not an inch of rain in 30 minutes. And so that is potentially one of the factors changing this discharge. So we're looking at a cycle here, probably, as well as um, a shift towards a tendency towards higher discharge going into the, the river as well because of the climate impacts. Um, phosphorus reduction, if we were to reduce the target, you can see how much these various blooms would decrease. Um, the, biggest, the biggest years obviously would not hit our target of a bloom equivalent to 2012. This year, we would be well below that. But even in those other years, uh, dropping the severity from 10 to six is a substantial difference in scale, duration, and the amount of scum. This is, this is a huge difference. So uh, we can get there. Um, 
a, a note on this is, you know, TPB increased from the 90s to the 20s, and that was changes in agricultural practice. So we can make a difference. We sent it one way, we can send it back as well. And there's work going on that Chris Winslow can tell you about on that regard. Right, Chris? <laughs> so a forecast three and a half, which is good overall. It'd be better if we're down at two or two and a half, but at least we should be seeing a smaller bloom, fewer scums as well. Scum does depend on the wind, wind event. Definitely less than last year, closer to 2020. So I will say most of like will be fine most of the time. Um, it doesn't, it takes a while to grow. The lake is warm now, so it should probably be growing through July. I expect by the end of July, there will be some visible discoloration in the lake as well. Um, again, areas with high concentration have the rise, highest risk of scum, and we, we show those areas well on our, on, our, on our imagery and the updates there. Um, so please check the bulletin for where, where they are. Um, I can't say enough, the blooms consistently produce toxin. If you're at a low or moderate, if the water is just, if there's no scums, the state of Ohio does monitor for toxin level. We also, we, um, we also do weekly updates. And so we can say if that's a risk, but a scum can concentrate to toxin 10 to 100 fold or more. And so please keep yourself, your kids and your pets, your dogs out of the water. There's a, tragically every year, a couple of dogs in this country die by having swum in, in lakes with, with these kind of blooms. So um, please keep them out. And blooms always impact it. Again, um, as I noted when the winds, uh, it, depending on where you are is which winds you'd rather like to see forecast. So thank you very much. That's my email uh, contact information if anyone has any questions. Thank you. Thank you, Rick. Great. So um, I'm going to open it up for uh, questions. So we have some media folks in the room right now, but I also have questions that were submitted online when people registered. So I could go to those too, but I'll look to the people that are here in person if there's any questions that we might have. Okay, please. I know everyone's going to ask, but uh, how much of the the lower severity, do you believe, is uh, attributable to just lower lower amounts of rainfall versus what farmers have been doing to try to reduce um, uh, runoff? Yeah. So the the question is about um, you know how how. Why would why are we seeing lower loads essentially? I, I think that for this year it seems like it's mostly because of lower rainfall. Um, but also I think we have to keep in mind that it might be detecting those decreases that are going to be happening because of agricultural practices. You know, we have to have patience. That sort of thing takes a long time, especially when you're talking about changing um, stuff like nutrient management and and stuff on the ground that can take a crop rotation or more to get that stuff and, and you know really to start to see any effects in water quality. And we're talking about wide areas of land that take a while. What I think is interesting for the Awesome. Okay. Now I can sing for you then too. Okay. So um, what I think is interesting for this year is that like through June, we had all these really big storm events, but they were really spotty. So it was like, there were some counties that I know had flash flood warnings and their cars are being like washed away. And then, you know, other places that are essentially entering a drought. And so I, I do have to wonder about how that affects what we see at the end of the watershed when we have, you know, varying different sort of places where a runoff is is coming from. And I think that uh, that that type of rain event is going to make it more difficult to detect the decreases that we want to see. The lo timing and location of the intensity of the storms. Yep. I had a couple questions for Rick. Um, you know, we, we've gone through a couple of major heat waves, uh, uh, the worst of which was before summer even started. Um, first of all, how much does the, you mentioned the lake warming up and 
how much does a uh, the intensity of heat how much is that going to offset the um, the lower um, uh, amounts of nutrients going in? The um, the phosphorus they need phosphorus to grow, so there's they are strictly limited by the amount of nutrients. So once it runs out of phosphorus, it's done. What the temperature does is determine how fast it uses it up. Um, in 2018. I'm a little hazy on this. It was there was a heat wave actually the end of May, and the lake warmed up really fast in June, and we actually saw an, a noticeable bloom the very end of June. It was not any bigger. 2018 was a fairly mild year. It just started earlier, and so a one risk with temperature is they could start if the lake continues to warm, we could see blooms starting earlier and lasting longer, but they won't get bigger because once they run out of phosphorus, they're out of phosphorus. That's it. So Tom, I got two online and then we'll come back to you. So um, I'm just reading these from online or they were submitted ahead. So I've got uh, Lester Graham, journalist in, in, in Michigan. Um, it's been suggested that a lot of nutrients are being stored in uh, the tributaries until there are heavy rain events. Um, how does this factor into the protection? Laura, you can take a cut at that. And I know I've talked with Jim Hood a little bit that, that we can uh, come back on that. So let's get that one. Yeah, so the, the suggestion that there's been, uh, there's phosphorus stored in tributaries. Um, basically, I think that the, the question is really, you know, how much phosphorus is in like the bottoms of ditches and streams and rivers or from the banks themselves, right? Because you have bank erosion and, and phosphorus can be associated with, with that as well. And that's something that's ongoing work. <laughs> We're like, we've been working with Jim Hood at Ohio State to basically try and better understand that. One of the things that's been really interesting that he's found so far from his research is that the, um, the, a lot of places have a lot of capacity to absorb phosphorus still. So while we always talk about how much phosphorus is coming out and going into Lake Erie, it's not at a point where all of these, these particles are saturated and losing stuff. And they seem to be still fairly good filters, but it's not consistent across the watershed. There are certainly areas where it might be releasing phosphorus from the bottom of the sediments, and there's other areas where they are um, like filtering out and absorbing it. And so what we're trying to figure out is what are the relative amounts of those two, and what effect do they have on how we would recommend maybe a, a best management practice for a given area, depending on what we see trying to build up our predictors to understand like this, because of how this area is, this geology is, we think it's gonna be absorbing phosphorus, which means maybe these types of BMPs are better here than over there. So I'll just add to that. I mean, historically, Tom, you're right. We used to treat the rivers as just pipes. It was taking what was coming off the fields and dumping into the lake. We now have the ability and grant money and in research into figuring out, are they just conduits or are they drawing down those nutrients or providing more nutrients? So. Long answer is to be determined, but we've got people working in that space right now. I'll get one more question from online. Laura, you may be able to answer this and some of the researchers in the room um, from uh, Kath Ann Kowalski, so a, a freelance journalist, uh, asking about how lake levels might be playing a role in HABs, because we know we've been at high water levels, still are at high water levels. Rick, you may have been able to take a crack at that one too. Uh, with the water level, when it was at its peak a couple of years ago, would have added five, six percent of the lake level. And and that's a tiny bit of dilution, but not a lot. Now, high lake levels do mean more water comes down the Detroit River. Um, but the overall impact is, again, probably around the 10 percent difference, which is small compared to what what we're dealing with on this. So not not enough to matter. Um, maybe when we get to if we get to a really low lake level contrast. We'll take a look once we get there. Tom, I'm coming back to you, but then I have a couple more online. Hey, Rick. Uh, certainly your agency and NASA are familiar with the climate change issue and are leaders in it. And uh, uh, I just wondered your thoughts of the last three years. There's going to be, you know, anomalies with any uh, climate uh, trend, but uh, it's always been said that this, we're getting warmer and wetter in this part of the country. And is the fact that we've had three years of lower flows than we have in the past, um, does that mean anything in terms of uh, climate change? Or are we still getting, like Laura said, uh, some intense storms, but the timing is a 
affecting how how big of the flow that, you, you know that you're going to get what what i my take on looking at at least the discharge data um i can't speak to precip because precipitation i i like to joke to people i work at NOAA and i don't do weather or whales um but the the discharge there are cycles in a lot of these big climate systems and what i think has happened is we've gone through a one of these wet cycles but superimposed is this climate factor where heavier rains are making more discharge so our baseline is changing so you've got a you might think of it going like this so it came down but perhaps did not come down as much as it might have 40 years ago or 30 years ago and so that could mean would the next peak be bigger? Maybe not, but I think I think we're going to see fewer low flow years. Is what I would expect is going to happen. They will they will be less common because if each time it rains, it's an inch of rain rather than a half an inch, then you end up with more discharge. So, and if it's wetter, we would just that alone would make a difference. So I think our lower ends are probably going to be less frequent than they were in the past, but we may be on a relatively compared to the terrible year, you know, the, the really high flow years of 2008 to uh, 17, it'll be lower, but it's not as low as what we would have seen in the past. Yeah, you know, so it means what this means is we got to get we got to get the concentrations down. That's, you know, it's load equals flow times concentration. Um, and that means getting that those those fields solved. So when we next have a large flow year, we don't have a mass, we don't have a bloom to Cleveland or we don't have scum in downtown Toledo. That's 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 what we need to get to. I have a question I'm gonna read you from uh, uh, one of our reporters. So Steve Davies with uh, AgriPulse, um, what impact does tile drainage have on the amount of P and N flowing into the lake? All right, yeah, so, um... So for tile drainage, basically from the USDA ARS edge of field network, where they've been monitoring how much um, both nitrogen and phosphorus comes off the surface of ag fields, as well as from tile drains. They have, I think, um, 40 different paired fields all over the Western Lake Erie Basin. And basically what they found is that about 80% of the dissolved phosphorus is coming out of tile drains as load. But what we have to remember is most oftentimes we can get events, rain events, where you don't get any surface runoff. It's such a short period of time that concentrations will be higher in that surface runoff. And so if we, you know, usually the next question is, well, what if we didn't have tile drains? So if we didn't have tile drains, we'd probably see more surface runoff. And then we'd have a situation where we would have higher concentrations making it to our waterway, which we also don't want. So we have to sort of meet that balance. There is some filtering of the phosphorus as it moves into the tile drains, just Maybe not quite as much as people used to think. And, and it looking does, at Terry Meshers, be like, did I say that right? That sounds good. <laughs> well, and the other thing too is, is when you see some tiles in some fields, the surface runoff might be more than tiles. So it is, as we always say, it's a field by field kind of case by case basis on that. But those are accurate. And I didn't talk about nitrogen at all, but we know that um, nitrate loads are usually very well correlated to tile drain density. Nitrate's a different story. It's mostly transported through tiles. Coming to more online questions, Jill Gentis, our communicator, is going to read these. Uh, a couple questions. Got it. Masks getting in a way. Did you have a preference here? Okay. Um, from the circle of blue, the data from Laura indicates that there isn't much change in either total phosphorus or dissolved phosphorus, dissolved phosphorus and concentration of what's draining into the lake are still high. Science is strong. What do we know about what's happening in the field? In the field? Yeah. I mean, I think it touched on it already. I mean, we are, there are many, many acres out there that are putting practices in. We have wetlands being constructed now. We know under a COVID year, it's not easy to move money from a great program like Governor's H2 Ohio and get it into the agencies and then let alone get it into the field. We do know that some of those practices are going to take time to draw down that. You are going to have a lag effect. Um, I have the pleasure and we're going to hear a little synopsis of, of work going on with the DNR on weight wetland placement and monitoring those wetlands. Those wetlands are going to take some time too. And so what we're saying is that even though we're showing here that we're not seeing those loads are still above the targets and we're not seeing a trend downward. And I know this is not what a lot of people that live on the lake or near the lake want to hear, but it's going to take time. This isn't something that's going to be fixed overnight. 
but I can argue that I'm, I'm seeing the right movements um, with our agencies and our academics happening in the field right now yep, and I, with the funding agencies. And, and I could add to that just very briefly is that um, when we look at things like the amount of phosphorus that's in, in the field, soil test phosphorus levels have been trending down and they have been for a very long time now. Um, a lot of times the uh, fields are in a negative crop balance, meaning there's more phosphorus being harvested than there is being added in a given year. And that's exactly what we need to see on the long term in order to see these sort of sustained reductions. We just have to remember phosphorus takes time to, to start to see those reductions. And thanks for adding that. We've seen work coming out of Greg Labarge looking at phosphorus sales and application rates. And the application rates are going down through time. Farmers are putting less fertilizers on the field. So that's there too. And we have a question here in the, in the audience, please, sir. So kind of a follow-up to some of what you were touching on with the agricultural practices. You both mentioned it'll take time for those to be detectable in data. Do you have any idea how long that might be or what kind of time frame we're looking at as far as when we might be able to see a difference? A very short answer would be no, <laughs> but we have some indicators. So for instance, um, if we're moving into changing our placement of fertilizer, like off the surface and into subsurface, then I think we can glean a lot from 2019 where, you know, we had about, you know, 50% of the watershed was unplanted, but also that means I think we have up to 46% of phosphorus wasn't sold for the watershed. And we saw a 30% reduction in loads that would go out into the lake. And then Rick found that that would lead to about a 50% reduction in bloom severity. So that 30% reduction had a huge impact over what the bloom should have been in 2019. So that's an indicator that we might see some changes faster than we would have expected. But that still means that 70% of the phosphorus at a minimum, probably, you know, based off of edge of field, maybe up to 80% is from phosphorus that wasn't applied in that year, right? There's phosphorus running off. They might, maybe you want to call it legacy, but I'm just going to stick with not applied in that year, which means that we know that, that that's where that patience has to come in. We have to be lowering some of the soil pools to you know, lower levels before we sit, start to see those reductions. So what we often say, there is just always right now, there is a chronic loss of these nutrients, whether you apply on a field or not. And it's gonna take time to find those fields, but also to address those chronic, again, I don't wanna use the word legacy either, but fertilizer that wasn't planned in, in a cropping season. I have, we have uh, close to switching over to talks here. Again, we'll have more questions if we didn't get to those on here. Um, one more real quick. Peter Kraus, Cleveland. Um, what is your outlook for the Central Basin and what is, uh, and what is getting here? Yeah, Central Basin and geographic area. So basically Central Basin, Rick, you can talk about it, but primarily it's winds and then other sometimes. There are um, two factors for the Central Basin. The first is winds and right now we, let's say central basin's in a better position because a milder bloom is less likely to go into the central basin or what goes in will be less, but it still depends on the wind. Um, 2019 was a really intense bloom and we had northerly winds. So it really sucked in Michigan and Ohio. Um, so it would, should be mild for the central basin. And if we don't have those winds, it'd be none at all. One caution though is there is, in early July, some years, there is a different bloom that forms in the central basin driven by deep water phosphorus, phosphorus coming out of the, the, deep, the deep basin below the thermocline. Um, that's not every year. We don't have enough of a handle on that in order to predict that bloom. We certainly see it and monitor it when it happens. It lasts for a couple of weeks. Um, and some years it's right in the middle of the lake, some years it moves to Ohio, and some years to Ontario. We say right now we don't know if that would happen but it's only the first couple of weeks in July when that does occur otherwise there would be localized there can be localized blooms in the central basin if you get a thunderstorm around some of the the rivers um, over on eastern Ohio there's what's called a thermal bar where the lake near shore is so warm within about a mile or half a mile it doesn't mix with the rest of the lake so that water may come in and produce a very short-term bloom around some um, some of those river mouths might last for a few days or so right after a thunderstorm. So in general, though, as far as a major impact in the central basin this year would be small. But I'm issuing a whole bunch of caveats that doesn't mean there wouldn't be something somewhere in the central basin. Eastern basin, we've not seen anything. Presque Isle Bay gets blooms, but those form within Presque Isle Bay. They do now come in from Lake Erie. 
Thank you, Rick. We're going to pause on the questions now. Uh, what we always like to do is after we hear the you know phenomenal loading talk from Laura and then the forecast from Rick, is we bring up some speakers to talk to you about other things going on in the basin, on the lake proper. And so it's my pleasure to introduce for everybody um, Santina Wortman, who is a, a scientist with the federal EPA, so US EPA, based out of the Chicago Great Lakes National Program Office. And so Santina is basically going to talk to you about what's, what's going on and the work that's going on under the Clean Water Act. I get to interact with Santina on a regular basis uh, with work going on with the Annex 4, which is the nutrient annex under the Great Lakes Water Quality Agreement. Um, but it's my pleasure to welcome Santina Wortman. Thank you, Chris. And thanks for the opportunity to be here today. Um, as Chris said, I'm here from EPA's Great Lakes National Program Office, which is out of Chicago. Um, and I'd like to talk a bit about, you know, what we're trying to do to reduce the nutrient loading going into the lake to prevent these harmful algal blooms. And I'm going to present kind of a different perspective, more of a regional perspective and a bit of a maybe longer term perspective. It was really, it's really nice to get to follow Laura and Rick because they just provided you so much great information. Um, so uh, what I work on in the Great Lakes Water Quality Agreement is the Nutrients Annex. And our focus has, has really been and continues to be Lake Erie because that's where the algal bloom issues are the worst. Um, back in uh, 2012, the agreement was amended. And after that, uh, we were charged with reevaluating what were the longstanding phosphorus targets to the lake which we did and we found that they needed to be reduced even further. So in 2016, the US and Canada adopted new target, targets for Lake Erie that I'm sure you're all aware of at the 40% load reduction. Um, so we're, we've adopted those targets and that was really just the beginning. We developed action plans to kind of outline how the federal and state and provincial governments are going to try to meet those goals. Those are the, we have a binational phosphorus reduction strategy and we have individual domestic action plans that are written at the federal and the state level. And we're really in the, um, deep in the thick, in the part of implementing those plans now. Those are five-year plans. And we're starting to monitor and eagerly hoping to see some type of progress and in, in how uh, the lake or how uh, our actions may be affecting what's coming off the land and into the lake. Well, um, as Laura said, we haven't really seen much progress yet with reducing phosphorus loads. And a lot of uh, the loading trends that we see is pretty highly correlated with flow. So Laura talked about the Maumee River. This is now panning out to the entire Western and Central Basin. So all the loads coming down from, uh, you know, from the Thames River in Canada, Lake St. Clair, Detroit River System, River Raisin, Western Basin of Lake Erie, and the Ohio tributaries as well. When we take all of that information together, we have a goal to reduce that level to 6,000 metric tons. And that's the red line on the chart. And we've only met that goal once in the last 10 years. Uh, as Laura pointed out, 2016 was a dry year. Uh, if you look at kind of the line superimposed on the bar graph, so the bars are the phosphorus loadings from different sources. The line is the runoff from major tributaries. And you can see it correlates pretty well um, that, you know, in, even in the, the last year, we saw a lower loading, and that was mainly because there was, it was a drier year. Um, if you take a closer look at this graph, uh, you have the different sources broken out. So we do track whether it's coming from point sources or non-point sources. And you see that the point sources are the, uh, towards the bottom of the chart there. They're pretty stable. Uh, that's a pretty steady source. The variability um, are the, the two bars at the top, which is the tributary non-point source loadings, again, driven by runoff. And so, as Laura said, we really have to reduce the phosphorus during the storm events. Um, we know that in, in some years, it's as little as 10 days per year that uh, the majority of the load is getting delivered to the lake, and that we're seeing more rainfall, more intensity of rainfall. And um, in order to, one way to, to address that is to lower the concentrations, and that's obviously our goal. Uh, we also, it would also help if we could hold more water on the landscape, and that's another part of our strategy. So we really want to see more wetlands. We want to see the soils functioning better so that they're holding the soil longer, um, and different types of practices that can just keep that water from getting into Lake Erie. 
So what will it take? That 40% reduction is a significant load, right? So 7 million um, pounds per year that the U.S. committed to, that's a really big lift. Um, and that's, it's challenging because everyone is very eager to see progress, but this is a very, very big challenge. Um, and one thing I want to convey is there's not just one source that needs to be addressed. Obviously, in the MAMI, the dominant land use is agriculture, but there are different types of agriculture operations within the MAMI. And we're talking about a landscape across the entire Western Basin that includes urban areas as well. We're talking about working with Canada. They have their own challenges with agriculture. So we really need every sector to reduce their load to the lake. We need reductions from all the sources going into the lake. And there's not just one thing that needs to be done to fix this problem, no silver bullet. We know that for the MAMI, which is our priority, because that's what really drives the bloom, we need very widespread adoption of agricultural conservation practices, and we need to implement them as a system. So what's shown here is that, you know, you need practices on the farm fields, right, to manage the nutrients better, manage the soil better, but then we need to couple that with things like, uh, what's number two there, a phosphorus removal structure. We can, you know, in really targeted places where you have high phosphorus coming off the field, you can install this engineered practice that has a slag in it that absorbs the phosphorus uh, before it discharges, right? And, that, and then you can couple that with another practice like a wetland to then let the water sit and you know, slow the runoff and retain it on the landscape. So we need systems of practices. It's not just any one thing. And we need to get less water running off the fields and then trap it on the landscape. So how are we going to get there? The U.S. Action Plan for Lake Erie is the overarching action plan that includes uh, basically what all the federal partners are doing in combination and in collaboration with the states, and then it has a summary of what each of the states are doing. Um, so I encourage you to look at that. If you haven't seen it, it's a five-year plan that's going to be up for renewal in 2023. And we basically laid out that we were going to, you know, leverage our different authorities and our funding resources, which are pretty significant, um, towards trying to solve this problem. Um, I work in, in the Great Lakes uh, Restoration Initiative Program, and we have devoted, uh, we typically spend at least $10 million a year on nutrient reduction efforts in Lake Erie. That includes the HABs forecasting and mon monitoring some of that work that you're seeing today. It also includes a lot of work on the ground, uh, working uh, with NRCS and other partners to implement practices on the ground. Um, when taken together with base programs. So for example, with NRCS and their base equip money or their special Western Lake Erie Basin initiative or their RCPP program, uh, we had charted out an investment of over $130 million that was gonna be uh, invested in the first few years of this plan towards nutrient reduction efforts on the ground and another 13 million for supporting science. So in addition to that work, we obviously are, are leveraging the states and their, you know, they have the authority to you know, imp implement through their regulatory programs, various permitting authorities. They have conservation programs at the state and local level. And on top of that, we know that we need you know, more than just the government uh, to fix this problem, but you know, the non-government organizations and industry-led programs like the 4R Nutrient Stewardship Program, those are gonna be really important to helping us achieve this goal. So are the investments paying off? Um, I wanted to share just a couple accomplishments to highlight. The first is that, you know, the city of Detroit, through um, optimization of their wastewater treatment plan, we've had a really significant reduction in the phosphorus loading to the Detroit River of 400 uh, tons per year. And because of that, Michigan was able to say they've already met half of their 40% reduction goal, basically. Um, when we talk about the cost share funding for conservation practices from federal dollars, NRCS and EPA through GLRI have basically doubled the amount of cost share funding that's available to farmers. And importantly, that num we're not just putting more out there the, of what any farmer needs. We're really focusing on nutrient management practices. A lot of those dollars are going to nutrient management, cover crops, animal waste storage and management, which are the key BMPs that we need to reduce phosphorus. On top of that, Ohio rolled out the H2 Ohio initiative, which as you know, is a huge boon and a huge investment for the state that's enrolling another million acres um, of cropland. And that's over 40% of the cropland in the Western Basin now um, being enrolled in, the, in that program and basically voluntarily doing nutrient management. 
So that's really tremendous. Then we're having all the wetlands that are being implemented and how that's gonna be treating and capturing runoff from agricultural land. When we take these things together, we can estimate approximately 3 million pounds we think we've reduced from the sources. And I wanna be clear that that's from the sources. I'm not saying that that's what's reduced at uh, Waterville as Laura showed that data. So we're not necessarily seeing a reduction in water quality, but we know that we're making an impact on what's going in to the system and that that impact is significant. I also wanna share a little different take and hopefully this doesn't confuse people because of what Laura was showing about we're not, we're not really reducing phosphorus. Well, we have some other metrics too. In addition to kind of flow weighted means, there's something called flow normalized, which is um, another way to kind of remove the effects of flow over time to really um, basically just look at that, that relationship as if there was no effect from flow if you will. So if you look at the orange dots on this chart, these were produced by um, Freya Rowland, Craig Stowe, Laura Johnson, and others, Robert Hirsch. Um, there was a publication that came out last year with data through 2018, and then I'm showing you now the data updated through 2021. You know, they're basically showing that over the longer term, the phosphorus concentrations, TP seems to be pretty stable. SRP looks like it's possibly starting to come down. Um, you know, that's, it's probably too soon to say, I can't say with any statistical significance whether that's a real trend, um, but I am glad to see it not going up and I'm glad to see that it's going in the right direction. Um, as we've talked about, the blooms are very highly variable as well every year. Um, I'm gonna go ahead and pass over this because I think Rick did a good job of explaining already that, you know, the phosphorus is a good predictor, but then there's winds and other factors that take over. Um, but some other bit of good news I wanted to share was just that, you know, when we look at those trends in the blooms over time, uh, EPA and Environment and Tran Climate Change Canada every three years issue a State of the Great Lakes Indicators Report. And the draft report that's about to come out this summer says that Lake Erie halves are poor and improving. And that's based on the fact that since 2012, the spatial extent of blooms have been declining. So not to say too soon that we're we're making progress here, but there are some early indications that, you know, blooms have been um, improving over the long term. They're seeing that there's less algal scum as well. Again, that's highly dependent on wind, as Rick said, and I don't have, you know, statistical significance to say that with, with certainty or that this is a strong relationship, but it is good that it's heading in the right direction. We know that the scums are really where you're going to see the high toxin levels, and so it is good, a good thing to see less scum. A couple key takeaways, the loads and the blooms are highly variable each year, as I said. And so, you know, we are not meeting the loading targets. Um, no one disagrees about that. Um, and there's a lot of different factors that are gonna be impeding our progress, including, you know, the climate, the land management, other factors. Uh, a couple of the things I've shared though, indicate maybe we are, you know, we are hitting in the right direction. We may be starting to see some change. Um, I certainly hope so. We have to keep an eye on it and, and really wait and see. As Chris said, it's going to take time. And, you know, part of that is that implementation that we need to happen across the basin is going to take time. We know we have a long road ahead, but I do want to emphasize that our current strategy, we think, is very much on the right track. The focus on nutrient management coupled with water management um, and all of the different players. So all of the partnerships we have going in the basin right now is really unprecedented, this amount of collaboration. So I just want to recognize that, you know, the federal, the state, the local, the private industry groups, uh, there's so much good work happening. And I really do think that um, we can continue that good work. We're, we're heading in the right direction towards success. Thank you. Thank you, Santina. That was great. Um, as I said, we're going to move into our, our next speaker. We'll come back. So if you have questions for Santina about that presentation, hold them and we'll get to them in just a second. I'm going to have uh, Mark Rowe, Dr. Mark Rowe, step up to the microphone. Uh, Mark comes to us. He's a physical scientist, but modeler with uh, NOAA Glarel. So folks that aren't familiar with that, Glarel is the Great Lakes Environmental Research Lab uh, that's based out of Ann Arbor. And so it's going to swish uh, uh, gears a little bit, but since we're talking about forecasting and models and NOAA work, uh, Mark's going to give us some insight into hypoxia modeling. And so I'm going to turn it over to Mark Monk. Please, Mark. Well, thanks for the introduction, Chris. And yeah, I'm going to. Okay. 
Yeah, so to switch gears a little bit here, we'll talk about a hypoxia forecast that we have developed for Lake Erie. And we've been producing over the past uh, few years. Oops. All right. <laughs> the wrong thing on the slides there, sorry. Bear with us while we get the slides up here. All right, thanks. So, yeah, uh, this is Mark Rowe from NOAA Great Lakes Environmental Research Lab. So I want to talk about the Nose Lake Erie hypoxia forecast, uh, status and future plans of this effort. So uh, just starting out with a little background on hypoxia, also known as the dead zone in Lake Erie. Um, so this is a condition of low dissolved oxygen in water when it gets down below about two to four milligrams per liter. Um, then it's an impairment to fish and other aquatic life. And it can also impact drinking water treatment, which I'm gonna talk about a little bit subsequently here. So requires two conditions for the development of hypoxia in lakes. One is stratification of the lake. So thermal stratification isolates the bottom water from re by the atmosphere. And then the second condition is that the rate of biochemical oxygen demand needs to be high enough to deplete the dissolved oxygen prior to the end of stratification. So the second driver is related to excessive nutrient inputs, which we've heard a lot about so far today. And then the first factor is more related to the shape and depth of the lake and uh, climatic conditions such as the, the weather. Um, so I'll just go back to this previous figure below in this slide. So the blue area in this figure is showing the hypoxic area of the bottom water of Lake Erie. And this is kind of the pattern that we often see depicted um, as far as most of the central basin being hypoxic and also being separated from the shoreline by a few miles, that boundary starting a few miles offshore. Um, but we can get hypoxic upwelling events where that bottom hypoxic bottom water comes right into the shoreline and it can affect drinking water intakes. So this figure, the black line is showing a time series of dissolved oxygen at the city of Avon Lake drinking water plant. And we can see it's usually around eight milligrams per liter, which is typical of the surface waters during the summer, but it can suddenly drop down to below two. And that's associated with these upwelling events that can bring that hypoxic bottom water into near shore areas where it can affect drinking water intakes and potentially cause fish kills. So these are the kinds of events that we were interested in predicting with a forecast. So low dissolved oxygen in itself is not really an issue for drinking water treatment, but it's other things that go along with it in the hypoxic bottom water. So on the left in this uh, image, we're seeing a picture of what can happen when we have elevated manganese in the water. So the hypoxic bottom water often has elevated levels of dissolved manganese, which aren't removed with conventional drinking water treatment, and then they can precipitate out in the distribution system, cause this yellow discoloration, which is regulated uh, both for aesthetic reasons and for health reasons in drinking water. And then on the right, you can see an association between pH and dissolved oxygen at the Ohio drinking water intakes. And um, the water plants have to keep the pH of the treated water above about seven and a half to avoid corrosion in the distribution system which can potentially expose people to lead. So in light of that background information, um, I worked on a research project over a five-year period with this team of researchers from Noah Great Lakes Environmental Research Lab and University of Michigan Cooperative Institute for Great Lakes Research. We also had partners at Cleveland Water and USGS. The goal of this project was to develop a model that could predict hypoxic upwelling events that affect drinking water plants. Uh, along 
Lake Erie shoreline and that would be suitable for transition to operational use at NOAA. And the project was funded by NOAA National Centers for Coastal Ocean Science. So at the start of this project, we conducted a series of focus group studies with drinking water plants. Uh, we visited seven public water systems along the Ohio shoreline to find out if this type of forecast would be useful to the public water systems. And we received feedback that Forecasts could be useful because it would give them advance notice of when these events are likely to happen so they can have their uh, personnel be ready to respond as well as having their equipment on standby and to have the consumable chemicals ready that they need to go to respond to these events. So we developed a model that was building on uh, NOAA's Lake Erie operational forecast system. So that's a hydrodynamic model that predicts currents, temperature, and vertical mixing in Lake Erie. And it's driven by weather data from observations and forecasts from the National Weather Service. And so we added to that a model that can keep track of dissolved oxygen and reduced substances in Lake Erie. The reduced substances diffuse out of the sediment and consume oxygen. Um, so the model simulates exchange of oxygen with the atmosphere, vertical mixing in the lake, and then there's specified rates of oxygen demand in the model that are based on field studies in Lake Erie. So we described this model in this 2019 paper um, that also did an extensive skill assessment of the model using observations from multiple research groups on Lake Erie, um, including Stone Lab, where we are today. And in this paper, we also described some interesting um, novel observations of spatial and seasonal patterns of hypoxia in the lake. So these figures are showing seasonal progression of hypoxia, the hypoxic bottom water indicated by the blue areas in these figures. So in July, um, one of the interesting things was we saw hypoxia initiating first along the Ohio shoreline. And then later in August, filling in throughout the central basin. And then in September, as the surface of the lake starts to cool, that surface layer deepens and starts to entrain that hypoxic bottom water. And then the edge of the hypoxic zone retreats gradually further and further offshore until sometime in October when the lake becomes mixed top to bottom again, and then hypoxia is over until the next season. And we found that these years when the hypoxia, and it sets up first along the Ohio shoreline, that's associated with years that have a predominant Southwest component to the winds in June and July, and that happens in most years, although not every year. So that causes a tilting of the thermocline that makes the bottom layer thinner along the Ohio shoreline and more readily depleted of oxygen. And regarding these events that occur, you know, a couple days at a time that brings the hypoxic water into the shoreline along the Ohio shoreline, these are associated with winds from the Northeast greater than about 15 knots, and particularly if it lasts for more than a day or two. Those were the indicators of when those events would occur. And I'll give a few highlights from an event that occurred in 2021 that had some significant impacts on September 1 through 4. So this figure was on our forecast website on 31st of August. So on the bottom there, you see the blue area indicating that most of the central basin uh, was hypoxic in the bottom water at that time, but it's also separated from the shoreline by a couple of miles there. But looking at this figure, which is showing the predicted change in bottom temperature and dissolved oxygen over the forecast period, we can see the blue color along the Ohio shoreline indicating predicted decrease in temperature and dissolved oxygen over the forecast period. So that's a visual indicator that one of these upwelling events is predicted to occur. And then looking at this windrose plot, which is also on the forecast website, um, we saw that northeast winds were predicted greater than 15 knots lasting for two days. And so that was all those indicators were pointing in the direction of a significant event occurring. So we sent out this email notification to a list of subscribers that goes out to about 130 recipients, including public water systems, uh, state and federal agencies, and uh, researchers around Lake Erie, indicating that there was a potentially significant hypoxic upwelling event predicted to occur. Now, over the next couple of days, there was a lot of media coverage of this event. 
because um, there was a strong odor associated with this event that affected communities along the shoreline. Um, some say it resembled the smell of a gas leak. Um, so there were a lot of 911 calls associated with that. And at least one of the evening news uh, video spots actually featured graphics from the forecast in an effort to explain to the public what was happening. This was a natural phenomenon occurring in the lake. Um, so we received some feedback from Ohio DNR associated with that event that the hypoxic model uh, helped with public outreach and expecting a fish kill. And once we received the upwelling warning, we've already received numerous calls from a variety of communities along the lake. So it was wonderful to feel um, quick and confident in our response. And that was kind of the public face of the event, but also important is what was happening at the drinking water plants along the shoreline. So they were scrambling to respond to this event. Um, and so we received feedback from Cleveland Water. Uh, they said the hypoxia model gave us notice that something was coming. This enabled us to prepare staff and our engineering groups so they could assist 24 hour operations during the hypoxia event with greatly expanded sample collection and testing. So when an event like this happens, it's all hands on deck at the drinking water plants. Um, they have to be responding to these changing source water conditions hour by hour as this unfolds. So it's useful to have the staff prepared for that to happen. And they also said, if anyone wants to know the value of the hypoxia model, we got a shipment of sodium hydroxide just in time for this event and expedited it in part because we thought this was coming based upon the model. So some of the chemicals that they need to use are used infrequently and they have a shelf life so they can't keep a big stock on hand. But that's the chemical that they use to control the pH to avoid uh, corrosion in the distribution system. So it's important that they have that um, on hand for these types of events. So uh, future plans. So even though the five-year research project has ended, Laurel's gonna continue running this experimental forecast um, this year as in past years, and it is up and running on the website. Um, Glural's in discussion with operational branches of NOAA to transition the project to a sustainable operational mode. And we have a proposed plan to do that. Um, and if that, that plan's under review, and if it is approved, then uh, the same group at NOAA INCOS that runs the Lake Erie HAB forecast uh, will start running this uh, hypoxia forecast in 2023. So that's all I have for today. Great, thanks, Mark, um, for the update on the HABS forecast. I'm gonna quickly run through, um, and hopefully I can do it justice, four projects that are going on uh, in Lake Erie right now or in the watershed that I thought folks uh, on the webinar would like to be informed of. I'm gonna run through these real quickly, but we have the PIs or, or key researchers associated with these projects in the room. So if we get questions after this really, really quick highlight, um, I'll open up the floor for questions for, again, Santina, Mark, or anything related to the presentation that I'm going to cruise through now. And again, warning, I will go pretty quick because I do want to allow for time for questions. Um, the first one you're starting to see as it gets into presentation mode is, is the H2 Ohio Initiatives um, Wetland Monitoring Program. And so basically, I'm going to run through some slides here talking about how we're using wetlands to assess uh, nutrient removal. As you can see on the left-hand side, and as you've heard throughout today is that none of this can be done by one individual or one institution. This is always a collaborative effort. And um, we've heard about the H2 Ohio program mentioned. So Governor Mike DeWine's uh, water quality initiative. Um, you're seeing three agency logos on this slide. Um, most of this investment is going to the Department of Ag for as we, we saw financial incentives for, for best management practices for producers. EPA is doing amazing work with hard infrastructure. So really looking at septic system upgrades and lead mitigation. Um, but I want to concentrate on, on the ODNR part, um, which, as you can see, says natural infrastructure, but this is really wetland restoration. And so what you're seeing on this slide is a, um, a snapshot of the, of the number of wetlands that have been deployed and, you know, either being constructed, are constructed, or being, you know, engineering design. And what's happening is that we want to monitor these wetlands. We want to figure out what they're doing um, to address nutrient runoff or store nutrients um, on the landscape. Um, but no one research or institution can do this heavy lift. And so what happened is um, the DNR contacted a group called LEARN, so the Lake Erie and Aquatic Research Network. And basically this team, which I'll show you the team on the next slide, is developing the monitoring plan that the DNR um, is following. And so you can see there's six different universities listed here from Ohio State, BGSU, Toledo, Wright State, Heidelberg, um, and Kent State. Uh, Laura Kinsman 
Lauren Kinsman Costello is in the room with us today. She's the lead researcher on this effort. And as you can see, it's not just these academics, but we've got a bunch of technical staff and students um, helping us out in the field. Um, the image on the left is, is the 10 practices that um, were addressed or mentioned under the governor's H2 Ohio plan. You can see of the 10, the one in the bottom right is, is wetlands. And so the critical questions here are really, do the, are the wetlands a cost-effective way to mitigate or manage nutrient loads? And then if we find out that you know, some of these wetlands are doing a very good job of this, how and why? And so then as we construct other ones or manage existing ones, how do we do this so that they continue to do that? So the wetland pro project objective is basically we're directly assessing nitrogen and phosphorus cycling in these systems. We wish we could look at how the wetlands affected birds and fish and other things, but right now our primary target is to look at that nitrogen and phosphorus cycling. Um, again, uh, Lauren Kinsman Costello is here and we can take questions online, but uh, I've also put Janice Kern's picture here. She's our primary contact with ODNR and, and she's the, the lead for, the, um, for our NAIR, so Old Woman Creek. And this slide is really just showing you this is not an easy task. You can see that in this process, we have to not only monitor the, the water um, that's moving through the system, which is this top little logo here, um, but you can also see we're looking at groundwater flow. We're looking at how the plants play a role, how um, water levels because of groundwater, what the soil looks like. So we're getting a lot of information out of this, this effort. The next thing I wanted to highlight a separate project is what's called the Pilot Watershed Project. Again, very, very collaborative, and I'll show you an obnoxious slide that highlights that. But basically what's going on here is there are heavy investment in practices in a small sub watershed, what is called the Huck 12 watershed. So about 6,000 acres. And so what we're trying to do is demonstrate the ability of um, can we move the needle, which was we've been talking about today, all these things that are being deployed on the landscape. Are we seeing the needle move at Waterville? Not right now. So we want to kind of downscale and look at a targeted area. And so hope the work that we do in the small watershed scale will, will be able to be extrapolated to answer other questions that have been brought up today. Um, USDA and RCS supported, you can see the dollar amount there and the time frame of this project. Um, farmer outreach will begin this fall and then we'll start doing practice deployment um, in the fall of 2023 through, through the spring. And again, collaboration is critical. Um, the place we're gonna be at is what's called shallow run. So you'll see this watershed in the bottom left-hand corner of this image blown up here to the right and it'll be compared to a group called um, Potato Run. But what we're trying to do in Shallow Run is to get 70% practice adoption rate in that system, and then compare it to Potato Run and see with this increased adoption rate relative to one that's held fairly constant, how can we actually measure reductions at the watershed scale? Um, lots of parts to this project. I won't belabor this point, but basically we're doing watershed evaluation and engaging farmers to get their um, willingness to participate. We're building a communication and outreach plan. We're making sure that we're storing data in a secure location. So we're protecting the farmer's um, property and in, in, in their data. There'll be limit implementation and then monitoring and not just monitoring water at the edge, but also monitoring things like yield. When farmers are doing these practices on the field, is it maintaining yield? And here's that fantastic but obnoxious slide of the partners involved in the pilot watershed. Next one I wanna to talk to you about is the Cleveland Water Alliance. And again, going through this quickly, if those of you that don't know the Cleveland Water Alliance, it's an NGO or a nonprofit established in 2014. Um, basically there it's commitment to clean water, but also the stewardship. So, that, so the, the, the maintenance and the, and the guidance of that clean water and the growth um, through a growth of industry and economy through innovation. Um, so a lot of cool stuff coming out of the Cleveland Water Alliance, but I wanna kind of talk about how they're, they're really just trying to build this innovation economic development cluster. So they're trying to connect researchers with agencies, with industry to make sure that we can protect Lake Erie, but also grow economy. So you can see there's industry leading companies here, utilities, maritime industry, but lots of federal, state, and local government agencies involved. So they're trying to build this regional innovation engagement, which I've seen evidence of. It's phenomenal. Um, they're supporting the growth of, of freshwater innovation. So ways to treat water, ways to detect pollution. Um, so a lot of technological advancements. Um, and again, the idea here is to spur economy and to go back to the words of um, Erica about uh, Senator um, Brown is that we don't need to have a, a conflict of a healthy environment versus a healthy economy. We can have both um, at the same time. And so then um, we're trying to drive innovation that matches what the market needs. So the Cleveland Water Alliance is doing a great job of connecting private industry um, with researchers and agencies. Um, and they're really trying to accelerate innovation so the two projects I really wanted to point out is what's called the Open Innovation Challenge under the Clean Water Alliance. Um, as you can see in the name challenge, basically they're working with industry 
to focus uh, innovation. So what things are needed by the industry that researchers can work on? Um, they do convene, um, convene these judging panels with so it is a competition or a challenge. So they pick the winner. They do provide these innovators with the opportunity then to test their winning project um, and validate their technology. Um, one of the examples here is a pipe farm that was actually built in Parma, Ohio. So they've actually built an underwater, what would look like a normal um, municipal water system. And they're using it to detect with technology without having to break the ground, the presence of lead pipe. The one that I wanna focus on the most today before um, I talk about the fourth project is water technology test beds. So what Cleveland Water Alliance is working on is, is to build these test beds where innovators can test their projects in the field. Um, so basically they can go out and pilot or test these technologies in the real world environments. So they've worked hard, meaning the Cleveland Water Alliance to standardize the locations that these tests can occur and also the equipment that they're using to assess the, the efficacy of their work. And there's a lot of legal and insurance things that, that happen here. We want to protect, protect intellectual property. We want to make sure that um, everybody is um, protected as we move forward in these pilot projects. And so here is one of those um, pilot projects, this test bed. So what we're showing here is um, they're trying to increase our ability to do real-time monitoring. And what you're seeing in this, this heat map is the different green colors that you're seeing, which those of you online, if I don't use the pointer, you can't see. Um, these green dots are locations of these, these um, basically telemetry infrastructure. Um, and so this is where they're at now. You're seeing the blue dots, but this is the plan of where they're heading. So dialogue is happening right now to identify partners at each of these dots. And the goal really is to be able to, in near real time, to look at weather conditions, water property, things like nitrates and phosphates, you know, PFOS, PFOS, microplastics. And so we're really trying to outfit through Cleveland Water's um, leadership in this space, um, test beds. Um, for the time, I'm gonna skip over this last slide and get into the last project. And, and we have a guest in our audience too, Dr. Mike Weintraub, who's the lead for this for University of Toledo. This is what's called the COMPASS project. And you can read what that acronym means here. It says coastal observations, mechanisms and predictions across systems and scales. Um, so Mike is, is leading this effort for the University of Toledo, but um, overall it's led by the um, Pacific Northwest National Laboratories and it's funded by the Department of Energy. But Toledo has been a great convener of local parties here. And so really what we're doing with this work um, with again, University of Toledo and their partners is enhancing the ability to understand what's going on in these coastal ecosystems. So how is water specifically in the Great Lakes fluctuation and how it moves up into the watershed and, and out? How, how do we understand how these changes in, in the short term and long term affect these ecosystems? And so we have old models that exist, but as you can see in this bottom left hand picture, they're pretty simplified. What we're trying to do is some, add some complexity to these. So add depth to it, changing the shapes of these polygons, getting a better look. And so really what Compass will be doing is using an analysis of, of the interactions between the soil and the water and the plants in these inundated areas. They'll be looking at data synthesis. So how can we pull data from multiple sources and combine it into making predictions? Um, hierarchical models are mentioned here. Um, the partner location, of course, is, is Chesapeake Bay, if I haven't mentioned already. But this is what I love is, is this slide is, is there's going to be everything from the left-hand side, which is laboratory experiments, moving right to actually site experiments in the field. But then we're going to be able to take some observations, so sensor networks and, and remote sensing to really combine this. So we can do measurements and experiments on the kind of the small scale, but we can get these great like modeling and analysis efforts on the large scale and then get these things to talk. Um, and that's what Compass is really good about is, is grabbing people that are good in the lab or good in the field and getting other skill sets to the table. And so we're really excited what Compass is gonna do over the next handful of, of years. Um, so with that, again, four quick projects. I just wanted you to know the Cleveland Water Alliance is doing a lot of work in innovation and, and, and sensor networks. I wanted you to know that there's a pilot watershed to really look at a 6,000 acre you know, watershed and see if we do 70% of adoption rates, what can we measure at the mouth? I wanted to tell you about the wetland monitoring projects that are going on with LEARN and, and with the DNR. And then certainly last but not least, the COMPASS project to look at these fluctuating areas that are affected by rising and falling water levels and, and what's going on in those ecosystems. So with that, I have a ton of questions that were still submitted ahead of time. I know that Jill Gentis in our, in our office is looking at some online questions. So I'm gonna open this up really for anybody. So I know we have representatives of the four projects I highlighted, Santina and Mark are still here. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna come through some questions. Um, so that, well, if my computer didn't shut down, I would. Um, off the top of my head, I know we had one that was, um, and Mark, or it could be Rick on this one too. People are asking, cause we had a Habs, 
um, forecast, but we also had a hypoxia forecast. We have a question about how does HABs and the size of that HABs maybe impact the size and the occurrence of hypoxia. So Mark, I don't know if you can take a swing at that one. Okay, thanks, Chris. Yeah, that question about HABs and hypoxia. So I would say that both of these phenomena share an underlying cause, which is um, excessive nutrient inputs are fueling both of them. Um, the harmful algal bloom itself is not necessarily the main driver for the hypoxia. The hypoxia is fueled by excessive production of algae and organic matter that settles out into the sediment of the central basin. But um, a lot of that comes during the winter and spring when diatoms are kind of the main phytoplankton that's being produced and those settle out quite readily to the bottom and contribute a lot of organic matter to the bottom. Um, another distinction is that the harmful algal bloom seems to respond to year-to-year -year changes in nutrient loading, whereas I think the hypoxia is less responsive year-to-year -year because it's fueled by an accumulation of organic matter in the sediments that has built up over some period of time. Um, one paper looked at that and said that maybe it responds to nutrient loads averaged over seven years. Um, but in any case, we could expect perhaps more of a lag in response of hypoxia to nutrient reductions once they do occur. Um, however, I think there is some, some hope in that when we look back at the 1990s, hypoxia was less severe. And we saw from the presentations earlier today that the bioavailable phosphorus inputs to Lake Erie were lower from about the mid 1980s through 2000. Um, and we did see less severe hypoxia during that time. So I think there is hope that uh, we could see a response. Mark, thanks for that. Um, we do have a question coming in and, and many people may have seen a, a recent model or a recent publication that comes out that talks about the research of the interaction between phosphorus and nitrogen in HABs. Um, but to follow that up then it's, and how might this interaction impact the models? I can answer the last part, but Rick can kind of come up and echo with me. But um, the models, as we know, it's we're looking at phosphorus loads. We want to know what the flow of phosphorus is in from a load concentration and that predicts the model. So really the nitrogen phosphorus interaction isn't going to help out much with the model. So I'll turn it over to Rick to make sure I didn't screw that up. But then Justin, if you have time to come up and talk about that interaction between phosphorus and nitrogen. The, um, there's um, essentially a ratio of nitrogen to phosphorus that drives um, that the um, algae need. And there's more than enough nitrogen going into the lake to supply all the nitrogen to, to create the bloom until it runs out of phosphorus. Now, at that point, the lake gets complicated, but nitrogen, the lake actually starts losing nitrogen. So the blooms, there's interesting questions about how long the bloom may last if that continues. But the short one is there's way more nitrogen than we need to get this bloom going, and it runs out of phosphorus first. Um, and then after that, starts to lose nitrogen. Uh, hello, this is Justin Chaffin from Stone Laboratory. Um, so so uh, Rick's correct, but uh, I would add that in the late fall, uh, when the lake does run out of nitrogen, the blooms could be worse if, if the lake still had enough nitrogen. Um, so, so phosphorus gets the bloom going, it, it determines the size, but once it runs out of nitrogen, uh, there's still some phosphorus around. The bloom would be worse if not for nitrogen limitation. And also I'll add on the um, um, toxicity discussion, uh, the amount of nitrogen um, and also the amount of sunlight and water clarity has a role in bloom toxicity. Um, so nitrogen is also important. But I'll just add there, we can't treat multiple different water bodies the same. You know, the dynamics of where nitrogen is coming from in Lake Erie is going to be different than where you're getting nitrogen from in Grand Lake St. Mary's or Buckeye Lake or other reservoirs. So it's not always apples to apples. This forecast is really concentrated on, you know, the harmful algal bloom in the Western Lake Erie Basin. I will come, Justin, you might be able to feed in this and same for you, Laura. Um, the question that came in is how do uh, the algae types we see today presenting harmful algal blooms different from the types we saw in the 70s um, on Lake Erie? Um, great. The blooms we had in the 60s and 70s were mostly nitrogen fixing cyanobacteria, um, mainly a phanazomenon and what used to be called anabina. Uh, today, the blooms are microcystis. Uh, and then there is a nitrogen story there. Uh, uh, 
the anabina and the phanazomnon can survive without nitrogen in the water because they can use atmospheric nitrogen. Microcystis needs nitrogen in the water. So the fact that we have microcystis now and not anabina or a phanazomnon is an is indicator that we have a lot of nitrogen coming in. Uh, back then, the most of the uh, the nutrients were coming from untreated sewage, which tends to have a lot of phosphorus relative to the amount of nitrogen. Thanks for that, Justin. And, and if you don't mind standing up here, I'll ask this next one. But I know Rick um, flew into Cleveland yesterday and drove by Sandusky Bay. But one of the questions is, is how does how does sorry what do we know about Sandusky Bay's planktonic non blooms in 2020 and 2021? So if, you, if just to set the stage, usually when you look at the, the heat map that Rich shows of, you know, the red colors are blooms and scum formations, even before the bloom develops in the Western Basin, you're always seeing those reds and oranges or usually seeing those reds and orange in the Sandusky Bay. And so the question is when in 20 and 2021, those blooms were far reduced. So if anything, Justin, you have to add to why that might be, and then I'll turn it over to Rick too. Um, I would first say that we don't quite know why. Um, I know there's lots of speculations. Um, uh, George Bullerjohn from, from BGSU has speculated that removing of the Ballville Dam might have changed the sediment dynamics in Sandusky Bay. Um, you know, that's still a speculation. Uh, but now there appears to be a bloom of a phanazomnon, which is pretty, it, which doesn't no, nor, normally occur in Sandusky Bay. Sandusky Bay is normally planktothrix. Uh, we're st still looking into that. I don't have much to add, but there's also microcystis in Sandusky Bay, which is not expected. And I, I looked at water yesterday, and there was no, almost no planktothrix. So go figure. We're not we we got work to do. But uh, George Bullerjohn has a major project on this, and Laura might have some insights into the nutrients. Yeah, the, the only thing I can add is that, you know, we've had three years that have been pretty dry once we get into summer. Um, I know 20, what was, well, last year we had a little bit more July load than normal, but because of the timing of fertilizer application relative to our storm events, the, the nitrate peaks that we get haven't been quite as strong. I know our summer loads have probably been lower. And since Sandusky Bay is very much driven by nitrogen availability, I think that there's high, I think there's a high probability they just have been running out of nitrogen sooner than normal. Juggling multiple microphones here. So the other one, and I think this is just really general and I'll take, take a crack at it, but I'll offer opportunity for other academics. Will H2O Ohio help with filtering slash slowing down nutrients from the watershed? And I think we've talked a lot about the deployment of best practices um, that producers are using and being incentivized for, but I think the ones that I wanna highlight again is the wetland project. Um, when I think of filtering or slowing down wetlands, are, we're, we're confident that the wetlands being constructed are gonna do that. Not every wetland constructing is gonna do it the same amount, right? Because there is variability. Not every farm field is a farm field. Not every wetland is a wetland, but that's part of the learn effort, again, led by Kinsman Costello and Janice Kearns to really assess that. But the other thing I'll add, and I'll look at some of the ag folks in the, in the room is um, of those 10 practices we listed, one of them that is getting more attention now is two-stage ditches. And when I think about slowing nutrient runoff or filtering nutrient runoff, those two-stage ditches have shown some evidence from research to be successful in that space too. So I just wanted to highlight those efforts that are going on um, in that place. I did wanna mention there's a question coming in saying, um, is there a way nonprofits can take samples of stream water and then um, your organization or our organizations sample those um, so we can get some more information out there? Um, it wasn't mentioned in the, in the work that I mentioned for the Cleveland Water Alliance, but they are doing a lot of community or citizens science projects that are going on right now. So there are groups out there. I know a lot of the local Rotarian groups have an opportunity to get engaged. So I would encourage, please reach out to, to me at Sea Grant, um, but all, you can also go to Cleveland Water Alliance's webpage. And there are a lot of opportunities out there for folks to help collect samples. I will say that um, you can't just go out and grab a bucket and take a sample. If you wanna get engaged in some of these, there will be some training. So some volunteer or docent training to figure out how to do it the right way. Because we wanna make sure the data that we're collecting is collected in, a, in enough rigor that we know that it can be usable and that we can get some trends um, out of. Jill, I'm gonna come to you. I've pretty much exhausted most of the questions that I've got in front of me. I have a question back here. Let me come. So 
Chris answered this a little earlier, but a lot of times we talk about harmful blooms and reference to larger water systems like the Maumee in Detroit. What are some of the benefits of res researching and restoring smaller watersheds? Restoring. Yeah, so I will say, you know, and I see Laura's getting up too. Um, it's, these big systems get most of the attention, right? But we, what I know from our work um, managing the Ohio Department of Higher Education's Harmful Algal Bloom Research Initiative, that we're funding a lot of research to go to uh, drinking water reservoirs. So a lot of the drinking water across the state is coming from water pumped from rivers into these upground reservoirs, and then the water is held there. Those are getting blooms also. And so what we're working with those groups is to figure out what algicides they could be using to eliminate those blooms or how can they filter, uh, filter and treat that water. So um, those smaller systems are getting a ton of attention. I know there's a lot of work going on in Buckeye Lake, Grand Lake, St. Mary's, Chippewa Lake. There are tons of lakes out there um, that are having these issues, maybe not on the scale, um, but there is a lot of small watershed stuff. And maybe you can speak more about the pilot watershed too also in that small watershed scale too, Laura. Yes, I guess I could clarify what you were actually asking because my brain went in a different direction, which was like, why would you restore the portage if all we care about is the Maumee? Okay, and so, and what we need to remember is that um, these other smaller watersheds, while they don't contribute the same load, they have very similar concentrations. When we move from essentially the Maumee, the portage, and the Sandusky, the amount of phosphorus in their stormwater is very similar across all three of them because the land use is similar. And so you might argue we could probably fix it all in the Maumee, but that's hardly fair to that whole region and every little bit really helps. So, so having that sort of larger scale like approach to redu reductions is good. The other thing that's interesting is when you look at the Maumee itself, there's subwatersheds that don't contribute as much, like the Tiffin River or the St. Joe compared to some of the southern watersheds. Why would you do reductions in those if they already have somewhat lower concentrations? And the reason there would be because if they can get even more reductions, all of that combines to come out at, at Waterville, and that would contribute to lower amounts getting into the lake as well. Sometimes when you have more moderate levels, maybe even lower levels of phosphorus, you can have bigger reductions because you don't have to wait for as much legacy phosphorus to move out to see those reductions. So I think it's fair to consider everywhere for BMP placement and nutrient management. Laura, always so much sharper than I am and knowing what the actual question was rather than what I answered. That's fantastic. Um, some other ones that are in here, there's, and, and I can probably take a crack at these, but then I'll have Laura fix it, right? Um, so the idea of what, one of these, what, are, what would help if we had real-time dissolved phosphorus, in particular phosphorus, and plug those into the models? And Rick, you, know, you and I talked about this a little over breakfast. In the model, what it's looking at is total load for that one March to end of July. So having real-time daily information on that doesn't change the way that the model ultimately functions at the end. Is, is that an accurate assessment? I'm getting a nod from Rick. So there, could I miss the first one up? Now I'm back on track with the second one. No, it, so, so Rick's follow-up, maybe it might matter for a, a more of a management level, smaller watersheds. In that case, if you knew that some loads were coming in at a smaller time and you could actually control them but with a river the size of the Maumee, right? And I want to clarify too, I had mentioned that in, in some of these upland reservoirs, algicide is one of the ways that we're controlling those blooms. Those reservoirs are not large in size. <laughs> Algicides are not the solution for us for Lake Erie. The, the amount of those things that would be applied and the unintended consequences of some of those um, could be um, very impactful. Again, some of those reservoirs are, are maintained only for drinking water. There's not a lot of angling that goes on there and those sorts of things. And so um, there's a more complex situation in, in the Western Basin of Lake Erie. Um, that's all I'm seeing as far as the questions I have again, Jill, do you have a couple? She's bringing me a laptop. We have about two or three minutes left. Okay. Oh, so for me directly, great. Um, does H2O utilize the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service National Wetland Inventory Program to identify wetlands in the basin? So um, I'm actually going to turn that over to you, Janice. Do, uh, what, what is informing most of the identification of what wetlands should be placed in the basin. Eric, you want to go with that one? Uh, thanks, Chris. Uh, Eric Soss here with the ODNR H2 Ohio program. Um, so we look at uh, a number of factors uh, on where to place wetlands. Um, right now, we take a, an opportunistic approach where um, stakeholders, uh, NGOs reach out to us with 
proposals for uh, wetland restoration projects. And then we compare that to heat maps of where we know uh, nutrients are coming in and, and sub watersheds. Uh, we prioritize projects based on that. Uh, we're also looking right now at a strategic approach of looking at the map first and finding the project second. So we're exploring that at the, at the moment as well. And I'll just add to there before I take the last question over to Lauren Kinsman Costello. I mean, one of the products of the wetland monitoring is to find out which wetlands are doing the best, and that will help inform where those get constructed in the future too. Um, so I think this will be the last one that we have time for. Um, has the potential for new and restored wetlands increasing carbon loading been considered? This could be important to hypoxia and drinking water. So Lauren, I'm putting you on the spot. Yeah, that's an excellent question. Uh, so I'm, lead, I'm Lauren Kinsman Costello I'm from Kent State University. I'm the research lead for the H2 Ohio Wetlands Monitoring Program. And we are driven by the agency priorities. And right now the ODNRs and the state of Ohio's priority is to understand how these projects work in terms of nutrients, specifically nitrogen and phosphorus, because that's the main focus of H2 Ohio. But we recognize that all of these projects are gonna have implications for all of the other functions that wetlands perform, including habitat for fish and plants, and also really importantly, carbon storage, and on the flip side, the potential to um, emit some greenhouse gases. So an unfortunate flip side to wetlands is they're actually really good at producing methane and nitrous oxide, which are greenhouse gases. So we recognize that there's a really great opportunity here to study the effects of these wetlands, both on nutrients and these other services. And we're actively pursuing opportunities for what we call complementary research. So talking to other researchers, making our data, um, our contextual data about all of these projects as we're collecting them as available as possible so that other researchers can come in and apply for complementary research grants or get other funding to support research into these other functions and services that these restorations uh, might be performing. And that will inform you know, more, more holistic, hopefully, decisions about management and restoration and wetland use on the landscape for all of these potential services and disservices. If anyone wants to do that, let me know. <laughs> so thank you, Lauren. And I just want to round us up by just saying thank you to all the elected officials that are in the room and, and those that are online. Same thing with our agency partners. And I can tell you in, in my time in my academic career and my role here at Sea Grant, I have never seen as much collaboration as I'm seeing now. And it's not only between the academic institutions and the agencies, but across academic institutions and across agencies. This HABS issue and, and the nutrient loading is really, it is an all hands on deck kind of thing. And it's been an absolute pleasure to work in this space. Um, so thanks for being online. Thanks for joining up. We will work to get the recording online. Um, we'll try and get some of the questions that came in that we weren't able to get to respond back. If we can do an FAQ on the website. But again, thank you. And I wanna thank you all our speakers. So thank you, Rick and Laura and Santina and Mark. And hopefully the four projects that I highlighted, I didn't butcher, um, but we have uh, a lot of folks here in the room still. We have surf and turf. I'm just kidding. We don't have surf and turf for lunch, um, but everybody online, thanks for joining us and have a, a wonderful Thursday.